Hi class, this is Jessica. I am going to go ahead and start covering 5.1 and 5.2 for today since we did not have class um, at 8 a.m. this morning, okay? Um, I did have to take my son to see the doctor and so like I promised, I'm coming in here and covering this material for you guys so you don't miss out on us working together on your final review. So I'm gonna switch over to my camera real quick. And there we go. So here's the chapter five workbook I have already set for you. I'm gonna kind of angle it this way because I'm sitting over here. There we go. Okay, so in this content, in this chapter, we're gonna start talking about those exponential and logarithmic functions that I kind of forewarned you guys about on Wednesday's class. Um, and so eventually we're just gonna start like basically defining what it is and what it looks like. Then we'll start talking about the graphs of them. Um, and then we'll start evaluating some expressions that have exponential functions. Um, and then we'll actually end up going into the applications of everything with exponentials, okay? So 5.1 is about exponentials, and then 5.2 will introduce the logarithms, okay? So let me fill my paper upward, and here we go. So, so far, this textbook has dealt mainly with just algebraic expressions. So that includes, you know, your polynomials, your linears, linears are polynomials, really. Um, and then your rational functions were the new one, okay? Um, in this chapter, we're gonna study two types of non-algebraic functions, okay? So these are a little bit different than the traditional stuff. However, we will still have to keep in mind all of those things that we've learned in the past because it will um, still take effect in this section as well, especially when we learn how to turn these kinds of non-algebraic functions into algebraic expressions when we start solving. So right now we have the definition of an exponential function. It says the exponential function f with base a is denoted by f of x equal to a with the exponent of x. So this is a lot different than what we were used to. With polynomials, we were doing things like this where you had some kind of number as your exponent. So your base here was the x, and then the exponent here was a number. You know, it could have been a squared, it could have been a cube, it could have been a fourth power, whatever, but it was a number, okay? Now, in this section, we're now swapping those base and exponent values. So now, this number will be given to you, and it will be a number greater than zero, and your exponent is the variable now. Okay, so the base is no longer the variable. The exponent is now the variable. So let's go see what that's going to mean for us. Just to kind of clarify, it tells you when the base is equal to one, you have the function f of x equal to one with the base x. Now really, it wouldn't matter what the exponent is of one, regardless if this exponent is a positive value or a negative value or even zero you will still get one when you try to evaluate it, okay? Therefore, um, it's just equal to one for any and all x values. That's why this function is just called the constant um, function. And normally, you'll see here on the definition that it says a cannot equal one. Because if a is equal to one, then you're not really talking about an exponential function. You're just talking about the constant function f of x equal to one. However, um, you have evaluated that type of expression for integer and rational values before. You have done it, okay? So let's say for instance, the a is equal to four, and then they want you to figure out what you get when x is equal to three and when x is equal to one half. Well, in that case, the expression f of x equal to a to the power x would look like four to the power x. And so if I'm plugging in three into that function, it's gonna look like four to the third power, which when I type in my calculator is just 64. And when you plug in one half, you get four to the power one half, 
which we already know how to manipulate this. It's literally the square root of four raised to the first power, or just the square root of four, which we know is two, okay? Um, however, to evaluate four raised to any real number x, you would need to interpret um, forms with irrational exponents. So numbers that you can't necessarily change into uh, fractions. Because if I can convert it to a fraction and I've got a fraction as an exponent, I can change it to this form and then be able to simplify it. But irrational numbers are numbers that cannot be written as a fraction. And so if you have something like an irrational number, um, like for instance, down here where it says a to the square root of two, this is not a number that can be written as a fraction. It's a decimal, it's an ongoing decimal that just keeps going and going and there's no pattern or repeating um, happening here in this decimal value, okay? So in those cases, um, it is best to use your calculator to do that. Um, otherwise, you're just guessing. You can round it to one decimal place and get a number that's an approximation. Um, you can round to two decimal places, get a better approximation, uh, three decimal places, and so forth, okay? So for us, normally we're going to be typing all of these values in our calculator. So we won't have to mess around with that information too, too much, okay? Um, now, here we go. We have use a calculator to evaluate this function here. And so before I do that, um, I'm going to share my screen because I want to see something in just a minute. I do not have my calculator from school with me, so I'll be using this calculator. But I did want to get an image of your TI-36 Pro because um, if I can see that image, wow, it's only $4.90 on Amazon now. That's interesting. Ah, uh, yes, this is what I need. I wanted to zoom in here so that I could point out to you um, the buttons that you would be using to type these in there because it's not exactly the same buttons that I see on the note page, okay? So for right now, I'm gonna go back to my camera. Um, let me stop sharing for just a second. So here they want us to evaluate this. So I would be plugging in my calculator for part A, I would be doing F of negative 3.1 because the X is now negative 3.1 and then two to the power of negative 3.1. So remember, this is just notation. This is saying the function value or the y value when x is negative 3.1. And I'm about to tell you what that value is, OK? So the x is negative 3.1. Once I'm done, this is actually the y value, OK? The function value is the y value. Now, and I'm going to go type that in. I'm going to type it in on my computer just so that you can see how I do it on just so we can get the answer. So for here, I'm gonna type two for my base. And I actually think, yeah, two for my base. And then I'm gonna hit this exponent button. And then I'm gonna type um, negative, oh, it's not letting me do negative. So I'm not sure how I'm gonna get, and there it goes. And then I can hit enter and it gives me 0 0.1166291. And I'm just gonna stop it there because I ran out of space on my um, computer, okay? So I do end up with this value here. Now, let's see. how to do that on our computer, on our calculator. So how do you type two to the negative 3.1 in your calculator? See, I did it here in this computer calculator, but on yours, you would actually type the button two, and then you would hit this button here, 
that allows you to type in an unknown exponent. And then you would just type negative 3.1, okay? So not, I think we've used that button before when we've had to type in cubes and fourth powers and whatnot. So not too much new information there. Let's go ahead and try this one. This one's gonna be f of x equal to, or f of pi equal to two. And notice there's a negative there. So it's gonna be negative pi. And if I type that in my calculator, I do end up with 0 0.1133147. And then the last one, if I'm trying to find f of three halves, it would be this base um, 0 0.6 to the three halves power. So in your calculator, you would have to type 0 0.6. Then you would type that button with the x to the power zero. You would also type the other button that has a fraction and then enter three for the top, hit the down arrow, enter two for the bottom, and then hit the right arrow and then hit the enter. Okay, so that would be your keystrokes for um, these particular problems. So let's go see the next example. So now it says in the same coordinate plane, sketch the graph of each function. Okay, now they're not, they haven't told us anything about the graphs just yet. Um, so I'm going to kind of give you some information here. Um, the key thing that you wanna do when you're trying to graph these is always use um, this chart here. So you'll do um, negative two, negative one, zero, one, and two. And this is the chart you should use for all the problems where you're graphing exponential equations, okay? or exponential functions. So if I do two to the negative two in my calculator, I'm gonna get one fourth, so 0 0.25. If I do two to the power negative one, I'm gonna get one half, so this is 0 0.5. If I do two to the zero in my calculator, I will get one. If I do two to the one in the calculator, I get two. And then finally, if I do two to the second power in the calculator, we get four. Okay, so if I try to draw that for part A, it looks like negative one, negative two, one, two, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So negative two and 0.25, negative one and a half, zero and one, one and two, and then positive two and four. The graph looks like this. Now, understand that it does have an asymptote. It has a horizontal asymptote at y equal to zero. So this left side of the graph will not touch the x-axis, okay? It will get really, really close as the further left it goes, but it will not touch that x-axis. Now, let's go ahead and graph um, part B. So I'm gonna do the same chart with the same x values, but of course my outputs are gonna be different because my function is different. So I'm gonna do four to the negative two, which is one over 16. And I believe that is zero, one, two, five or something like that. So let me double check real quick. Oh, way off, 0 0.0625. Then four to the negative one is one fourth, which is 0 0.25. Four to the power zero, anything to the power zero is one. Four to the power one is four. And four squared is 16. So if I try to draw this one for graph B, oops. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. One, two, one, two. So let's see, negative two, it's almost on the x axis, almost. 
This one isn't much higher, very little. This is at zero and one. This is at one and four, and this is at two and 16. So it still has the same kind of graph. Just notice that this one is way more steep than the other graph, right? The bigger that this base gets, the more steep your um, curve will look, okay? Now, what I want you to notice is that all exponential functions, if you have an exponential function like this, no matter what the base is, you're always going to have these three points. You're always going to have negative one and that base, actually the reciprocal of that base, because if I plug negative one as my exponent, you do get the reciprocal. You're also going to have the point zero and one, because when you plug in zero as your exponent, you will always get one, and then one and the base itself. Because when I plug in a one as an exponent, you just end up with a all by itself, okay? And if you pay attention to the last two problems, we'll verify that this is actually true. So if I follow this um, program here, we've got one over two because two is my base. This one is always the same. And then two, because that's my base. And I do have those points. Look, this is negative one and one half. This is zero and one. And this is one and two, okay? If we come over here, I can say I'm gonna have negative one and one over a, so one over four, zero, zero, and one over the base itself, which is just four. And again, notice that I do have those three points on my chart as well, okay? So you, if you remember this information, you do not need to create the chart all the time. Or if you do create the chart, you only need to worry about negative one, zero, and one, okay? Because they will always have those three points. And then you already kind of know how the curve is supposed to look. So once you have those three dots on there, you just draw the curve in the manner that it should um, go. So let's see what they have here. So this is some general information. Notice that the domain does go forever to the left and forever to the right. The range does not go below zero and it doesn't ever touch the x-axis. So the y value will never actually be zero, which is why there's an open bracket at zero. But it does go up forever to positive infinity. It does have a y-intercept of zero and one, no matter what that base is, it will always have this exponent, okay? And then you have increasing. Notice that if I trace it from left to right, it is just going up the entire way. And then x the x-axis is the horizontal asymptote. So we know that y equals zero is that horizontal asymptote that we've seen in the past, okay? Now, what they want you to know is that if you have a fraction as a base, that's what this means. When you have y equal a to the negative x, you can use some properties of exponents to rewrite that as negative one to the power x. Um, because when you have exponent raised to an exponent, you usually multiply those together, which is where the negative x came from. But this means the reciprocal of a. So it means one over a to the power x, okay? So you can do the same thing. Now notice that if I have this as my base, I still have those same three points. So if my base were something like this, I would still have um, negative one and one over this base. I'd have zero and one, and then I'd have one and that base itself, okay? But the reciprocal of a reciprocal is just the original value, which is A. So notice that these look different than the way they looked when this is not a fraction. They almost look backwards, but the same process is still the same. Negative one, reciprocal, zero, one, one, and the base itself. So this should have be the reciprocal of the base, 
and this should be the base. And if you take the reciprocal of the base, it'd be a over one, which is just a. Okay, now, but notice in the graph, when you are graphing something that has a fraction, okay? When you graph, I don't know why I put a two in there. Notice that when you graph a fraction, that the curve actually goes in the other direction. Because when you plugged in negative one, you get a higher value than when you plug in positive one, okay? And so that's why it looks like it's a curve facing the other direction, but the horizontal asymptote is still zero and the y-intercept is still zero. The range is still the same. The domain is still the same. This time though, it's actually decreasing always instead of increasing always. Um, so here it says, as a result, the graphs, both of them pass the horizontal line test. And we know from the last section that if it passes the horizontal line test, then it's called one-to-one. -one. And if it's one-to-one, -one, we know that it has an inverse. And I kind of already forewarned you guys the last time that its inverse is those logarithms. But we'll talk about that in a little bit, okay? Right now, knowing that an exponential expression is one-to-one, -one, it lets us make this um, claim here that if you have a base and an, and an exponent and the same base and possibly a different exponent, the only way that these two expressions can be equivalent to one another is if their bases are exactly the same and their exponents are exactly the same. And it's very evident that the bases are the same here. So then it's only left to show where the exponents are the same. Um, for instance, if I give you an example to try to solve an equation here, if I tell you 2 to the power x plus 5 is the same as 2 to the power um, negative 4 x, and I tell you to solve for x, you're going to use this one-to-one -one property and tell me that this statement means that this exponent has to equal this exponent. And then by our process of solving equations, I could minus x on both sides to get the variables all to one side. And then I could divide by my coefficient and I end up with that negative one equals x. And so therefore I've solved for x, right? Um, you can check your answers, right? It's always helpful to check your answers, but never are you required to do so. So here we get two to the positive four and negative and negative is two to the positive four. So it does turn out to be equivalent, okay? But you do use this property to solve exponential functions. Okay, now we're gonna introduce another special exponential, okay? You know that you can have any base. Your base can be you know, a whole number. Your base could be a fraction. You can have any kind of base. Your base could even be an irrational number. Like square root of two could be your base, okay? Um, pi could be your base. Any number could be your base. Any real number could be your base, as long as it's not one and it is a positive number, okay? But there's a special kind of number that has some cool, interesting properties later, especially when we start getting into logarithms, okay? Um, and just like pi, it's a number a lot like pi. So we know that pi is 3.14159, blah, 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 right? Um, it just keeps going on and on and on forever. But you know this number. This is an irrational number. It comes up a lot in nature, especially when we're talking about circles. And so this is a number that you've come to get used to. However, there is another number out there that is not the same value, but it works a lot like the way pi does in that it does naturally occur in nature. And it has um, some interesting um, values about it. So that guy is actually called the natural number. So we know that this one's called pi. This new number we're gonna talk about 
you use an E, a lowercase E to write it. And it's actually the value 2.7182812828. And this does not repeat. So I know it looks like you got 1828 there and another 1828 there, but it doesn't repeat after that. So this is just coincidence that it repeated once, but the next few numbers do not repeat that 1828 sequence, okay? So it is not a number that can be converted into a fraction. Any decimal that is repeating or that stops like 2.7, those can be converted into fractions. But when it's ongoing and it doesn't repeat, it cannot be converted into a fraction, okay? Now this E is called our natural number. And the further along you go into calculus, and if you take classes beyond calculus, um, the more interesting things you'll learn about that natural number, okay? For us, we're just gonna stick to how it concerns us with our logarithms and our exponentials, okay? So when you're writing the function f of x equals to e, which is 2.718 to the power x, this is called the natural exponential function. And the e itself is the base, right? So it's called the natural base. And if I draw it, it looks like this, okay? And so we know that e is 2.7 something or another, so it's about right here, right? Um, and then if you do one over E, I'm not sure what that value is. Let me try my calculator real quick. One over E, you get 0 0.3678, so on and so forth. So that makes sense that it's about a third here, okay? Um, and so you've got those three points there, the one and the base itself, zero and one, and then negative one and the reciprocal of that base, okay? So this one says, be sure that you see that for the exponential function, E is a constant, okay? It's not another variable. It is a number, just like pi is a number. So every time you see the letter E, you have to remember that that is just a number and it's this number, okay, 2.718. So let's go ahead and use our calculators to evaluate some of these values. So they're saying evaluate this function for these X values. So F of negative two would be E to the negative two. F of negative one would be E to the negative one f of 0 0.25 would be e to the 0 0.25 and f of negative 0 0.3 would be e to the negative 0 0.3. Now you will type your calculator, type this in your calculator just like you did the other one, but let me share my screen with you because you need to find the e button on your calculator. So the E button is actually right here. It's like two buttons below the second button, okay? So you've got this shift kind of button, the second button that allows you to type anything above a key. Um, but you also have this guy right here where it says E and a little box. If you press this button twice, it will give you 10 with a little box. So make sure that you only press it once. Once you click that button, it'll automatically pop up the E and then it'll be blinking in that little tiny box for you to type in the exponent. And then you're simply just gonna type in whatever exponent it is that um, you're supposed to be plugging in, okay? So for me, I'm going to do this first one and I get 0.31. 3533, three, three. make sure you're getting the same values as I am. E to the power negative one is that same 0 0.367879, so on and so forth. E raised to 0 0.25 is 1.284025, so on and so forth. 
and then e to the negative 0 0.3 is 0 0.74081822, so on and so forth, okay? So make sure that you are able to type these expressions, these four expressions in your calculator, and that you are in fact getting these values. That way you know for sure that you're typing it incorrectly. Okay, so now we can finally get into some applications of these exponential functions. Um, and so one of the most common things that we use for, we use exponentials for, um, is growth and decay. Now, there's different kinds of growth and decay. You know, of course, we are living organisms. We live in a world where there's living organisms. And living organisms, of course, grow. And then once they die, they decay, right? So that does serve us a lot of purpose in the science realm. However, in the finance realm, money can also grow exponentially or the interest that you owe that you owe for borrowing money or the interest that is earned for someone lending you money um, does grow exponentially or at least it can okay in the past you've only dealt with simple interest and that's when you had the interest was your principal times your rate times your time very simple interest However, that is not usually the case when you go out to buy a car, right? They do not use this simple interest rate to calculate the amount of interest that you're going to owe. They do not use a simple interest rate when you go to get, open up a credit card, okay? They use more elaborate interest um, formulas. And what they do is they call, they call it compounded. It's the word that they use, compounded. Compounded just means how many times they collect how much interest you're going to owe and add it to your balance. And then the next time that they have to compound, they're going to take the principal that you started with plus the interest that they tagged on to it, and then they're going to use that new value to figure out what the new interest is that's going to get added onto that balance. So it's like your balance just keeps growing and growing and growing and growing if you just let it sit there over time. That's why it's super important that if you have your credit cards or you have a card payment that you are making those payments on it, because then that interest can just collect and collect and collect and it gets greater and greater. And a lot of times it gets to the point where it's almost impossible to pay back, right? So you really, really have to stay on top of that. And it all has to do with this compounded word, okay? So depending on the kind of company that you have or that is out there, they will compound a certain number of times per year. Sometimes they only compound it annually. So sometimes they're only collecting your interest at the very end of the year and then tagging that on to the amount that you owe, your balance, right? However, most credit cards compound your interest um, every month. So at the end of the month, they'll look and see what is your balance, how much interest are you going to owe on that balance, and then that interest gets added to your balance, okay? And if you don't pay anything for that balance, that new balance is what's going to be used to calculate the next interest for the next month, okay? So that's kind of how that works. Now, in this formula, you've got a whole bunch of different variables here, okay? So A is really... They really should use B, but they used A. So A is really the balance inside your account after however much time has passed, okay? P is the principal. So that's the original amount of the loan that you borrowed or the original deposit for an investment that you've made, okay? And then R is the annual interest rate, and it always must be in decimal form. So a lot of times they'll give you your interest rate in percentages, but you must enter them into the formula in decimal form. And then N is the number of times that it's compounded per year, okay? And of course, T is time, but it's usually measured in years. So let's go see some of these application problems. 
Now it says using exponential functions, you can now develop this formula and show how it leads to continuous compounding. So that's another way that companies can compound your um, stuff. So they may not compound. This is the most, this is like the one you don't want, right? If you're talking about a loan, but if you're talking about an investment, <laughs> this is what you want to shoot for. You want to shoot for something that's getting compounded as much as possible so that you can make as much money. But if you're loaning money or you're borrowing money, then you, of course, don't want it to be compounded that often so that you don't have to pay so much back on top of what you borrowed. Um, but there is something called continuous compounding. So I can compound, you know, annually, which would mean once per year. I could compound biannually, which would mean twice per year. I can compound um, quarterly, four times per year. I'm trying to think if they have a chart for all the different values. If not, I'm going to write them down. Yeah, it does not have it. So. If you compound it annually, okay, that means that n is going to equal one. If you compound it semi-annually, that's gonna be two. If you compound it quarterly, n would equal four. If you compound it monthly, n would equal um, 12. I'm trying to think of the other ones. There's daily next or weekly. There's weekly. So n would equal 52 because there's 52 weeks in a year. However, there's also daily. And depending on what book you use, they use different numbers for daily. So I'll have to confirm in the textbook, what number they use. But for daily, it's very debatable depending on which textbook you use. So some textbooks use 360, some use 364, and then some even use 365. So it really just depends on which book. Since we are using a certain book that's tied to your homework in WebAssign, I wanna verify which one of these it uses. If I see the word daily, most textbooks stay away from the compounding daily only because um, depending on who you are in the math world, um, you might choose a different value for the daily. So normally we don't deal with daily. However, it can happen every minute. They could compound it every minute. Your interest could be compounded every second. It could be compounded every millisecond. But when you start getting into those tinier and tinier and tinier increments of time in between the compounding, you eventually get closer and closer to this thing that we called continuous compounding, okay? And so they're just like always compounding your interest, okay? And I know it sounds scary, but as we start to evaluate some of these things, you'll see the difference between the amount of money you'll owe if something were compounded annually versus the amount of money that you would owe if it were compounded at its craziest compounding rate, which is continuously. And the difference between those two balances is not all that awful. So it's not so bad. It sounds really scary, but it's not that bad. Okay, so to accommodate more frequent quarterly, monthly, daily compounded interests, um, they let n be the number of compounding per year. And so then what you end up having is, is you end up having to use this formula. Now, this is the main formula that we're going to use. So notice that all the variables are the same. The only thing different between this formula and the previous one is that now I have to divide my rate by n. And I think I still have a power of n. Oh no, it's the same exact formula that they had on the other paper. So same variables, everything. Now, when it talks about compounding continuously, okay, the formula that you're gonna use for compounding continuously has to do with that E. So you're gonna take your principal times E and then RT. 
Notice that there's no in in the compounding continuously formula. And the reason is, is because it's not compounded a certain number of times, it's just continuously and always being compounded. So there's really no number to give to you as far as how many times it's going to um, be compounded, okay? So we're gonna go ahead and go into some applications of this stuff. So here's the formulas. You've got compounding for a certain number of times per year, and then you have continuous compounding. So you must have these two formulas on the test. You will be given the two formulas. You will need to know what each letter stands for and how to apply um, this formula, but it will be given. You won't have to memorize them. So let's see here. So for example one, it says you invest, or example four, sorry. You invest $12,000 at an annual rate of 3%. So here I'm seeing that R is equal to 3%. I need the decimal form. And if I type 3% in my calculator, it tells me it's 0 0.03 is a decimal. If you don't know how to convert decimals, you basically take the decimal that would be behind the three and you move it over twice to the left. And so now it becomes 0 0.03. Three. And because you moved it over twice, this symbol is no longer there anymore. Okay, so it's now a decimal instead of a percentage. The balance, ah, see they use the word that balance, the balance after five years, when find the balance after five years when the interest is compounded quarterly, monthly, and continuously. So if it's saying five years, then I know that's my time. Time is in years. So my T is five, but it's asking me to find the balance. And we know that A is the balance. So they want me to find A. So let's go look at what they've got here for their solution since they do already have them worked out for me. So there's the formula. I know that for A, which was quarterly, right? For quarterly compounding, N is equal to four. And we know that the five years means that T is equal to five. And we know that the 3% means R equals 0 0.03. So they're just plugging in all the numbers. And what did I invested? I invested $12,000, right? So your investment or your loan amount is always going to be the P. So P is always your investment or loan amount. Always, always, always. And A is going to be that balance afterward. Um, so they plugged in 1200 for the P. They plug the one is a one, it doesn't change because you do have to pay the principal, whatever it is for sure. And then you have to pay the interest on it. So that's why there's a one there. And then this is gonna calculate the interest. So you're gonna pay what you owe and then some, right? So the rate is up here, the N is here, and then the N times the T. So everybody's plugged in exactly according to that formula. And since there are no variables here, there's no X's on this side of the equation, I can type this entire expression in my calculator and it will pop this out. Now you are always talking about money when you're talking about these investments and loans. So you always should only round to two decimal places. Unless the problem asks you to round to the whole dollar, normally you're gonna be rounding to two decimal places for your cents, okay? So for part B, that one was compounding monthly. And we talked about when it's monthly, it should be N equals 12. T is still five, rate is still 0 0.03. And of course our investment is still 12,000. So they've plugged everybody in there and they've typed it in the calculator and they did end up with this value here. Now for part C, that one was different. That one said for us to compound it continuously. For continuous compounding, you must use the formula for continuous compounding. You cannot use, um, and please have um, plug everything in there. So P is the only thing I need. I need R, which was the 0 0.03, and I need time, which was the five. No N is involved in compounding continuously. 
And when you type that whole thing, this is not a variable. Remember they mentioned that. Remember this is not a variable. It's just a number 2.78. So you can type that entire thing in your calculator using that E button. You would type the 12,000 first, then that E button, and then type your 0 0.03 parentheses five close parentheses, and you'd be able to get this value in your calculator. So here we have some practice problems. They want us to sketch these graphs. And so we're gonna use that um, information that I told you guys about, where you're gonna use negative one in the reciprocal, zero and one, and then one in the base itself. So for here, when I do these, I'm gonna have the points negative one and the reciprocal of three, which is one third. I'm gonna have zero, one, and then I'm gonna have one and the base itself, which is three. So if I plot those values, negative one, negative one and a third is about here, zero and one is here, and then one and three is up here. And so the curve does go in this direction. However, when I'm graphing this one, you have to remember, that that is two to the negative one times X, which means it's one half to the power X. So when I go to graph this, it's gonna be negative one and the reciprocal of one half, which is two over one, then zero and one, and then one in the base itself, which is one half. So if I graph this one, I get negative one and two, zero and one, and then one and a half. And so this curve actually goes in the other direction. Okay. Number three is tricky, but it says use the one-to-one -one property to solve the equation for X. So remember the one-to-one -one property says that if you have this, if the bases are the same, then that does mean that the exponents would also have to be the same in order for them to be equivalent to each other, right? So my job, since I already know what the base is on this left-hand side, my job would be to try to figure out what the base would have to be, what the exponent would have to be with that same base, okay? So you're trying to figure out three to what power is gonna equal one over 27. I'm gonna do my work over here. But I know 27 is three cubed. And then we know if you wanna take the reciprocal of a number, it's actually the same as writing a negative exponent. So one over 27 is actually the same as three to the power negative three. And if you wanna verify it, you would type it in a calculator and just make sure that it's actually one over 27 so that you are writing an equivalent expression and not just changing everything all together, right? Once the bases are the same, I'm gonna use that one-to-one -one property, which tells me that then the exponents must be the same. And to solve this equation, I'm gonna add two to both sides, and I end up with X all by itself equal to negative one. And so we have solved this equation here. Um, practice four is one of those applications. It says a philanthropist deposits $2,000 in a trust fund that pays 5% interest compounded continuously. So there's that compounded continuously. That automatically means I'm using this formula, not the other one with the one and the N. Um, it says the balance will be given to the college from which the philanthropist graduated after the money has earned interest for 40 years, how much will the college receive? So let's put in, he deposited this amount. So that's gonna be our P. This is a percentage, which means it's our rate. And as a decimal, it's 0 0.055, right? If you take that and you move it twice, and then T is actually equal to 40 years. And those are the only three variables I need to find this formula. So I'm gonna plug everybody in.
And I should be able to type that in my calculator and um, let's see here. And then just round to the correct decimal value. So 2000, one, two, three, um, E. I saw an E, where did it go? There it is, E. And then raise it to 0 0.055 parentheses 40. Close this parentheses and I will hit enter. So I get 1805.0. 27. Um, it's not a crazy number, but I do need to round that to cents. So this seven will cause this two to go up. So it's actually $18,050.03 that the college will earn or the college will get after the 40 years. Okay. So that's pretty much all we'll be doing with those exponentials. Um, however, so here we're gonna have 5.2, which is actually the introduction now to the logarithms. So we do have to recognize and evaluate some logarithms. Um, and then we're going to have to um, talk about those graphs. And then we might actually have to solve some equations. And then of course, eventually talk about the real life models. So let's go ahead and get started. So this is the formal definition of a logarithm. You will definitely have this formula, but this formula will be super, super important. So basically what it tells us is if you have your values in this setting, that this expression can be rewritten as an exponential, okay? And so then you have this equivalency here. So this if and only if statement just basically means that this implies this statement and vice versa. This statement implies that statement. Hence the double arrow um, on that expression, okay? So this is the formal definition. It's basically taking an exponential function that you have and then converting it over into this form, which is the logarithm. Now, if you notice, pay special attention to where the y is in the exponential. Notice that y is the exponent of this exponential equation. And notice over here, you're saying that y equals a logarithm. That's super important to identify because a logarithm is essentially just an exponent, okay? And you can see that there, that it's just the exponent that would need you would need to have with this base, with this base A, in order to get this value X, okay? And so that's literally what um, a logarithm is. It's just figuring out what the exponent would have to be so that you could end up with a certain value. So for instance, when we had that one over 27, we figured out that it was three to the power negative three. So if I were to write this in a log form, that would mean that my exponent negative three is actually log and my base is three. And then this value is one over 27. So when you see this expression, log base three of 127, it's essentially asking you what exponent should you have if your base is three to get this one over 27, okay? And we figured out that you needed a negative three exponent in order to get one over 27 if three were your base, okay? Now there's some important other things that we need to recognize. And that's one, we already know that our bases 
whether it's in the exponential form or the logarithmic form now, your bases must be positive. And we also know that they can't equal one because then we're talking about a constant function there. And there's, it, that's really not an exponential. The other thing is now they're saying that X can only be positive values. That is different from the exponentials. When we were doing the exponential equations, X could have been anything, positives or negatives, okay? But for logarithms, it's not defined for when the X's are negative, okay? So in this case, um, you're going to st strictly talk about when X is greater than zero. Now, I do wanna make you aware that when it's written in this form, okay, y is the exponent, even though it doesn't look like one, a is the base, just like it was in the exponential expression, and x is called the argument. So that's a new word or phrase that we haven't seen yet, okay? So this is a logarithmic expression with base a and argument x. And once I evaluate that logarithm value, I am essentially um, evaluating the exponent, okay? So if you write that as a function, f of x equal to log base a of x, it's literally called the logarithmic function with base a, okay? Um, and you read it as log base a of x, just like it says here in the red. I think I already said it like that, but just to emphasize it. Um, and so then sometimes when we're solving equation, it is helpful to switch over the forms to solve equations. So for here, they just want you to kind of show you some examples of how to go back and forth between the expressions. Now, my biggest thing when I'm going from this expression to this expression or vice versa, is that you have to understand that regardless of which expression you're talking about, A is the base. So the base is the base. When you go from here to there, the A base will become the A base. When you go from exponential to logarithm, the A base will be the little A base. The other variables will switch sides. So notice that over here on this left-hand side, X was on the same side with the base A. But when you go over to the exponential form, Y is with the base A. So that's usually how I do it whenever I'm trying to convert the two. So for instance, they have this problem here, and I know you have the answer there, but I'm gonna talk it out how you would switch it. So if I'm gonna switch this to an exponential, I would say base three, and instead of a nine exponent, because nine's already attached to this three, I'm gonna use the two exponent. And then I have no choice but to equate that to nine. And that is a true statement, okay? Now, if you have this expression, okay, Again, I'm going to use a log now because this is an exponential. So I'm going to have log with the same base five. And instead of three being with the five, the 125 will now be on the same side as the five. And so then three has no choice but to come over to the other side of the equation. Okay. So you're basically saying that this equation is the same thing as this equation. Okay. This is what I mean by notation. You know how on the test I keep docking people for notation, right? If this does not look like a subscript, which means it's lowered, and that does not look like it's lifted up higher like an exponent, that's not the proper notation. You cannot write log five of 125. That is bad notation. It needs to be log with a small five shifted downward, kind of like the opposite of an exponent, and then the argument 125. Notice that the log and the 125 are on the same line, right? It's the base that's kind of shifted downward. And the same thing with the exponents. Notice that the five and the 125 are on the same line, but the three is shifted up, okay? You must have that proper notation. If it does not look right, you will get dot points, okay? For every single time, every single problem where that happens, okay? So make sure that you're doing your notation properly for these logarithms. It is super important, not just for me as being able to read what you're trying to do in your homework, um, but also for yourself. Because if you start writing things in the wrong way, you're gonna 
eventually forget that five is the base and 125 is the argument and you're going to start doing things like just 5125 especially if I didn't put parentheses and I didn't write the five little it just looks like I'm taking log with no base and then 5125 which eventually when I talk about log with no bases or no visible bases um, this value is a completely different value than this one up here and so you could get the wrong answers if you're not using the right notation and you get yourself confused okay so it's super important to use that proper notation with these logarithms. Okay, so when solving logarithmic equations, if the X is in a place that you cannot um, solve for, you must rewrite it as an exponential, okay? So for this problem, I think they're just asking us to evaluate. So they're giving us the function here, and then they're saying evaluate it for when X is 32. So if you're going to plug in 32 for X, plug it in both here and here, right? And then, um, and then you would try to figure out what this is. And so how do I figure out what is log base 2 of 32? I'll give you a hint right now. You cannot type that in your calculator. At least not yet, okay? Eventually, we'll show you how to type this in the calculator. But for now, we need you to understand logs in-depthly, okay? Once we think like, you know, you've learned enough about logs and you kind of get the idea, then a few sections later, they'll eventually tell you how to type that in the calculator. But it's always better to understand how to do it before you start using the calculator, okay? Also, because if you somehow, sometimes type it in wrong and you get a wacky value, you should know intuitively whether that's a wacky value or not. If you know nothing about logs and you just get conditioned to using the calculator, you won't be able to recognize that the answer is wacky and that you typed it in wrong, okay? So it's very important that we do know how to do this by hand, just to start conditioning our brain around these logarithms. Okay, so what does this equal? I have no idea what that is, right? And according to what I just said, I'm not allowed to use a calculator to figure it out. However, I can use the definition of logarithms. So I know that according to the definition of logarithms, I can rewrite this as an exponential. I'm gonna use the same base two, and then instead of the 32 being my exponent, it's going to be this question mark as my exponent, and then I'm gonna have it equal to 32. And what is that asking? It's basically saying two to what exponent is gonna give me a 32. And you can go in your calculator and sit there and try a bunch of different things like two to the second power, two to the third power, two to the fourth power, two to the fifth power, until you come up with that value of 32. And it turns out that two to the fifth power is equal to 32. So what does that mean? That means that this question mark guy is a five. So now I know that the log two of 32 is equal to five, which is exactly what they have here, okay? Same thing for this problem here. You have log base three of one. I don't know what that is, but if I convert the form over, it's gonna be a base three with this exponent equal to the one and three, Actually, anything raised to the zero power is one. So now I know that the question mark is a zero. And so then this expression is a zero. And that's the zero that they have there. Now let's look at for C and D. So that was A, D. We're going to look at C. So they want us to plug in two. And we're going to look at D. So for C, they plugged in two for X. And then they're trying to figure out this expression. So again, you're doing log four to equals something. And so it's four to what power equals two. And we do know that the square root of four equals two, but the square root of four can be written as an exponent and that exponent is one half. So then that means that this logarithm expression is equal to one half. Same thing for here, they plugged in one over 100. So we're doing this. So you're saying log 10 of 100 equals what? Switch the forms over, you have base 10 equal to what exponent equals one over 100? Well, 
I know that 100 is 10 squared. And then I also know that if you have the reciprocal there, that's going to be a negative exponent. And so it turns out that that question mark is actually equal to a negative 2, according to that one-to-one -one property for exponentials, right? This means that the question mark will equal negative 2. And so that's why they got the value negative 2. So there are, there are lots, we're not going to get into all of them just yet, but there are a whole lot of properties of logarithms, okay? There's just interesting things that we learn, okay? But these are the first few logarithms, okay? So we know that anything raised to the zero power is one. So if I convert that statement that we already know, into its log form, you end up with this property here for logs. We also know that a raised to the one power is just a. And again, if I write this expression as a logarithm, it looks like this one. So if your base and your argument are the same, you just get one, okay? Um, and actually it's pretty general because this exponent is one. <coughs> When there's no exponent on a, it's automatically one. So essentially the log a and this base a cancel each other out. And that's why you just end up with one. And it's the same case no matter what that exponent is. The log base a and the exponential base a will cancel each other out, leaving you with just the x, okay? And vice versa, even if it's written as an exponential, the exponential base a and the log base a will cancel each other out leaving you with just that x. And then we also have another one-to-one -one property for logs. So if you have log with base a and another log with base a, the only way that these two logarithmic expressions are equivalent to one another is if this argument equals that argument, okay? So if x equals y. So you do have another one-to-one -one property that will come in handy when we're solving equations. So for exponential functions, the only way you can solve equations right now is to use the one-to-one -one property. For solving logarithmic equations, we have two strategies. We have one, we can use a definition to rewrite it, and hopefully that helps us and makes sense for us to solve. Or two, we can use the one-to-one -one property. And how do you know the difference between when you would use the one-to-one -one property versus when you would use the definition? And I will tell you how you know. So here's the one-to-one -one property. That's the one-to-one -one property. And here is the definition. Okay. How do I know when to use which one? You would use the one-to-one -one property when you have two logs with the same base. That's when you use the one-to-one -one property. When do you use the definition of a logarithm? When you have just one logarithm equal to a number, okay? So there's two ways to solve logarithmic equations and it all depends on whether your problem has one logarithm or it has two logarithms, one on each side. Okay. Of course, we've got to get into the graphs of these things. So I do want to point out that before I do go there, that um, we do have to remember that logarithms and exponentials, eventually they're going to tell us, but I'm letting you know now that they are inverses of one another. And we know that when they are inverses of one another, all that happens is that the X and Y values on those coordinates swap, okay? So because they swap, um, we're going to be able to use those same three coordinates for here, for the exponential as we do for the logarithm. So remember for the exponential, the points are negative one and the reciprocal of two, which is one half, zero and one always, oops, and then one and the base itself, which is two, 
So give me a second while I sharpen this and then we will, I will keep writing. And I think after this section, I'm gonna stop just because I don't recall how long I've been recording and I don't have a timer on my screen anywhere. I don't wanna make the video too long. So I might end it as soon as this one finishes and then we can continue where we left off in class on Monday. So the other value was one and the base itself, which is two. And so I've got these three points, right? And it wants me to plot them on the same coordinate system. So negative one, one, two, one, two. So I have negative one and a half, I have zero and one, and then I have one and two. And so you get this sort of um, graph here. Okay, now notice that this is a log and exponentials and logarithms, as long as the bases are the same, they are inverses of one another. So this guy is gonna have these same coordinates, but with everything swapped. So it's gonna have one half and negative one, one and zero, and then two and one. And so let's graph that one half and negative one, um, one and zero, and then two and one. And so you've got this curve going this way. And then if I had drawn it better, I can't draw it. <laughs> It should be a smooth curve. It shouldn't be doing this weird little dip in here. It's probably because I didn't put my one bar where it should have been. And you do have that point there. I tried to make it. It never comes out right because I'm not using graph paper, right? And it's just saying notice that if you draw the line y equal to x, that these are supposed to be um, reflections of each other over that because they are inverses, right? That was one of the qualities that we learned about inverse functions is that they reflect each other over that line y equals x. So there's them trying to do it. Oh, another thing we need to notice is that when you do draw the log curve, notice that it doesn't have a horizontal asymptote anymore. Now it has a vertical asymptote on top of the y-axis, okay? And notice that the domain never touches this y-axis, so it's zero, not included, all the way to the right, positive infinity for x. The range, though, goes down forever and up forever, so negative infinity to infinity. It does have an x-intercept, but no y-intercept, um, and it is increasing the entire time, okay? Now, Let's go. They're going to start talking about the natural logarithmic function. Um, but I think I want to stop here and then we'll continue the rest of it on Monday. Okay. So let me stop.